Hello everyone, welcome to AFCON Daily on United and Everything Football. This is a program that we've put together for you just to review all the games, everything that has to do with the AFCON. So as you know, the AFCON has started and the Black Stars of Ghana were in action against Cape Verde and that is the subject that we'll be dealing with today on Afcon Daily here on United and Everything Football. A very painful defeat as you can see I'm in my Ghana shirt. I'll be introducing my guest and we'll be going into what exactly happened in the game against Cape Verde. Um, as usual, remember to hit the subscribe button and hit the notification bell if this is your first time joining us. And if you've always been with us, to remember to leave a comment, drop a like. We'll be very much happy to hear from you, from your feedback and everything. Thank you so much for joining us and choosing us every single time. So we are going for a quick break. When we come back, we are going to continue. Um, and I'll introduce my guest and then we would have a great show. So stick and stay with us. We'll be back. Okay, thank you very much and welcome back to Afghan Daily on United and Everything Football. It's been another disappointing defeat for the Black Stars. It looks like they left, they continuing from where they left off in the last Afghan. After that embarrassing defeat to Comoros, the Black Stars have suffered another embarrassing opening day defeat to Cape Verde. No disrespect to Cape Verde. They were actually the best team on the day. They played so well. Everyone that watched the game saw how well they played. And so much respect to them. But for a giant that calls itself Ghana on the African continent and when it comes to African football, that was not what was expected of the country. And everyone that represented a country in that tournament. I'm joined by a very familiar face to this Afghan daily man who follows the Ghana foot, Ghana football a lot, gathers a lot of information about the game with Ghana football. He's called Scott Gillan. Thank you very much, Scott. Scott, interestingly, is in his Ghana shirt. It's so good to have you back on the show, Scott. Thanks, Kwame. Yeah, thanks for being having me. And uh, yeah, good to be here, although the circumstances aren't yes, what, yes, what yes. Uh, we were probably both hoping they would be. Absolutely. I mean, it's not, we, we wish we'd be here having a conversation about, I mean, a win rather than having to discuss a disaster. I call it a disaster because I feel what we saw today was an ISO. What's your general impression of the game first before we get into the specifics of the issues? Um, yeah, disappointing. I think everyone knows that the Egypt game and the second game was going to be a difficult one. And so it was important for Ghana to start start quickly, start well, at least come away with a point. Um, obviously, coming away with no points, Cape Verde having three points is a, a challenge for the for the tournament moving forwards, especially after seeing Egypt drop points. So knowing that they're probably going to be coming hard in the, in the second game as well. It, there was a door, a jar for Ghana to make a positive start. And it's a door that has closed in their face, unfortunately. Well, let's get to the specifics. We'll start with the lineup. I mean, when Coach Chris Hutton put out that lineup, what really went through your mind? What What do you think he was trying to do when he put out that lineup? Well, it was a surprise, actually. Um, we've seen him be very conservative, sort of double six, Alicia Awusu, Salas Abdul Samad, Sabah Salas Abdul Samad, Idrissu Baba, etc. Seeing a, a Majida Shimeru alongside Idrisu Baba was, I think, a, a positive step forward in terms of his willingness to be more attacking in terms of his sort of midfield profiles. Um, uh, obviously, there was the disappointment slash concern that Kudus was out. There had been rumoured that he was going to miss miss the game. There's also rumours that's unclear how long he's going to be out for us and obviously disappointed not to see him. And the knock-on effects that that has on the team kind of balance and structure as a whole it is always going to be concerning given how important he is to their offensive play generally. Um, Koenigsdorf obviously basically earned himself a spot playing against Namibia. His only start in a Ghana shirt played well back in the team, but a massive step. And I think that was my, my main concern was, yes, it was, I think, a positive step forward in terms of proactiveness, in terms of trying to be creative. Um, there are still problems with the creative profiles. Jordan I, Joseph Pansil, 
aren't amazing creators generally. Um, they have their their ways. Koenig Stoffer is similar, but they're not kind of the types of creative player that perhaps you you look for to be consistent creators. They're more complementary rather than than kind of leading creators. And so those are my issues. Number one, the fact that there perhaps weren't that many creative players in the team still, although there were better progressive players, but also the fact that most of the players hadn't really played together. Like Majid Eshimeru and Idrissi Babra, I think they played half an hour together. Mohamed Salis and Alex GQ, probably about the same. Um, Rather than Ransom Dubur, Koenig's daughter in his second start. So somehow we've got to an African Cup of Nations and Ghana once again feel like a completely fresh team with new faces who've never played together before um, and at the start of a, a cycle. What did you think the team lacked today against Kip Ved? Why did Kip Ved dominate Ghana for most part of the game, especially in the first half? As we could see, they were dominating yeah. us. They were better on the ball. Of the ball, they were better. They were far better organized. We found it very difficult to break them down. What do you think mm. was actually missing in the team? I think cohesion is a big part of it. I think the fact that there are so many new faces, loads of these players have got fewer than a thousand international minutes, and in most cases, many less than that. Very few minutes together. So a big lack of cohesion. Kate Birdie, I think, had much more of a plan and confidence in their plan. And, and I think it, I always go back to this. There was a quote, I think Pep Guardiola said it in one of the sort of uh, Amazon documentaries where he, he said his players had to play with courage. And I think one of the things about playing with courage is having confidence in everyone around you and, and that everyone's going to be doing their jobs. And my feeling was watching that Ghana team that that wasn't the case. And you can see when they're pressing that the gaps that are emerging, the players sort of talking to one another to try and get people to shift and move. Uh, and you see in possession, players aren't necessarily aware of where they like to go. The team is very left side dominant. No one's going past Joseph Pantzel. All, all these things that sort of makes you think they're almost a bunch of strangers playing together. All, in some cases, literally for like the first time, um, and, and that is that makes a big difference at this sort of tournament where you come up against teams like Cape Verde, who do have an identity, who can keep the ball well, who who can who who showed a lot of confidence. There was some Olay football. They were not making and, and and flicking rainbows over the top of the Ghana players. They were playing with courage. They were playing with confidence. Ghana, on the other hand weren't really doing that. And I think a lot of that is inexperience. A lot of that is a lack of cohesion and ultimately a, lot, a lack of kind of knowledge and, and, and confidence in what everyone else around you is, is trying to achieve. Now, let's look at that central defensive pair. Um, I felt uh, it's clear. Jiku was the outstanding, outstanding player on the pitch. I mean, nobody comes close. Whether his work rate, his determination to, you know, get the ball off the line, he brought us back into the game with an equalizer. But we look at his pair, Salisu. Um, the, in the build-up of the game, he had only played three league games coming back from injury. Do you think it was a right decision from Coach Chris Hilton to start him in the game? I mean, a lot of people were of the view that, yes, he had a lot of progressive players on the pitch in terms of, I mean, players who could progress the ball, who could do all sorts of things with the ball. He's one of them, but... If you look at his form going into the game, do you think it was the right decision from the coach? I think in, in the centre-back position, I've got quite a lot of sympathy with Chris Hewson. Um, I think he asked quite a lot of the centre-backs when you see the way that Ghana press. Centre-backs have to cover a lot of space. Um, they kind of help alongside the number six in midfield quite a lot of the time. So they're, they're having to be very, very mobile. Um, and, and I think the other options that he has, Daniel Amate is kind of lacking mobility these days. Um, and, and Nicholas Apoku, who, who is a bit more rational, I think himself isn't as mobile as, as whereas Salisu aren't, aren't as capable of doing the job that Salisu was doing. Obviously, the problem is that Salisu, as you say, is three league minutes, uh, three league games this season at, and ha hasn't played a minute of football under Chris Hewson for Ghana. So he's uh, sort of, I think, had 30 minutes against Namibia. So he, he's completely fresh to the system. But the, the question ultimately becomes, I think, is what are you trying to get out of this tournament? And that's whether you're you're looking at this tournament as something that, you know, we're just trying to be the best that we can in this moment, which I think regardless of who have you, who you pick in, in, in this tournament, you, it's not going to be ideal. Yeah. Um, or are you saying, look, we'll, we'll tr try and build through this tournament if we mm -hmm. are able to build into it and go long and go deep into the tournament, then great. But getting Salisu minutes in a system alongside Jiku, alongside Gideon Mensa, around some of the other guys in the team, for the long term of Ghanaian football, that's what they need. And I think that's potentially the, the argument for, for continuing and sticking with, with Mohamed Salisu. 
um, because I think he's better suited to the system, but I also think he's kind of a longer term play. I I am actually lost lost for words. I mean, in, in terms of the kind of football that we watched today to um, in, in the game against Kip Verdi. What do you think Chris Hilton was trying to do? What What do you think he was trying to do in the game with that setup? What, because a lot of people, if you follow a lot of the commentary around, a lot of Ghanaians are not so clear as to what he's trying to do. People bemoan a lack of a pattern, um, mm. not so clear. What, what You've watched the game. You, you are a very good student of the game. What do you think Chris Hilton is trying to do as a coach with this team? Um, I think he's identified a couple of issues. Um, that, that there are a lack of kind of progressive midfielders in the in the pool. Um, some of which is self-enforced, some of which is 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 just unfortunate that it's the case. So he's trying to build in different ways. I think he's trying to build down the channels. So essentially, kind of particularly down the left channel, uh, Jordan Ayew is a massive part of what Ghana do is they're trying to get the ball into Jordan Ayew's feet. Antoine Semenya drifts onto the left side quite a lot as well. And we saw Koenigsdorfer just drifting onto the left. So, And then when Dedi Ayew came on, he was drifting into that channel and Inaki was doing the same. So a lot of Ghana's progression was trying to go down the left-hand side of the pitch. It was Salisu and Gideon Mensah deep. It was Ashimeru was also on that side. Uh, and then those three were tucking in. And that's where Ghana were trying to, to kind of progress the ball. And then occasionally they would then try and go kind of from left to right and get Joseph Pencil in some sort of isolation opportunity with with his fullback. I think that was kind of the, the aim. Uh, I think he's he's also recognised that there's a lack of number nines. So he's trying to work on this kind of interchangeable front four, which makes it harder for the defence to pick them up. And I think it's kind of a, it's a throwback to some of the older Ghana teams that we saw in the past, yeah. where Ghana had kind of very interchangeable front fours. Uh, and I think in, in that sense, I think there are some positives to take from his approach. But I also think that there are there are there are personal issues. Um, it, it's some of these guys have been with the group for a while now, and it it, it seems too simplistic and too basic still. Um, and I think the sort of the Joseph Pantel on the right hand side thing, it, it, he's not potentially the best guy in the team to to, to do that ice, extreme isolation role where he's always against like one or two defenders. Maybe Osman Bakari is better suited to that, and Nicky Williams perhaps as well. Um, so there's a bit of misprofiling too. So I think that's part of the issue where we're struggling to see what he's trying to achieve because there's a bit of misprofiling. It's it's always a little bit that, that doesn't look to be as polished as you'd like it to be as well. Yeah. Um, and then also, I guess, on the right, Dennis Adoy is not bombing on and helping Joseph Pencil either. So that's another issue. Yeah. Um, so I can see why Ghanaians are, are concerned about the team. I can see why they don't think that there's particularly great deal of identity at the moment. Um, I think it's coming, but I think it's coming very slowly. And it, I think it's, well, it's coming too slowly for this tournament. Ideally, with the kind of players we have in this AFCON, um, how do you think we should approach games? And let's delve into the game against Egypt that comes up. Because clearly, um, it looks as if losing a game against Cape Verde, now going head-to-head -head against one of the tournament's favourites. I always call them tournament favourites because obviously they've got the pedigree, played so well mm -hmm. over the last AFCON. So even though they drew 2-2 two -two today, I mean, they showed what champions are made of to just get themselves back into the game against Mozambique. How do you think we should approach that game against Egypt? I think going to have to be proactive. I think that the, the Egypt side have obviously some very, very good players um, and they have a good pedigree, but I think they have their own limitations. They're, they're not the most effective progressing team. They're quite reliant on the counter-attack. Um, and I think what Ghana can can try and achieve is, is to sort of try and take the ball away from them, press them, push them into trying to play longer than perhaps they want to. They want to have the ball kind of comfortably at the back and be able to be quite slow in build-up. Um, and then kind of, again, we saw them quite a lot today going down the flanks. They they tend to sort of try and pass into the penalty area, but they were doing a lot of crossing today, which was interesting. Um, so I think there, there are ways to stop them. And I think that comes from kind of the nine in the middle of the pitch. That comes from being proactive, being more aggressive. Um, and then, but then also kind of letting that more kind of effervescent uh, attacking game show through. And I think in some respects, they almost need to throw a bit of caution to the wind now. I mean, yeah. they, 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 need to, they need to try and, 
win some games. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think that probably does come by trying to sort of unshackle Majid Ashimera a little bit, let him try and carry the ball through the midfield more, use the guard, the ball carrying that Ghana have. I think that looks you look, looks like having Ernest Nwama in the team. I think giving more players more freedom to sort of roam, carry the ball and try and be progressive and they have that kind of more rotational, unpredictable game, almost sort of street football, I think is, is almost what Ghana needs to do at this point is, is have that, that effervescence, have bring that kind of excitement back to the football that, that, that they're playing. Because at the moment, it seems stodgy. At the moment, it's slow. It's, it's ponderous. Um, and I think the players are, are playing a bit afraid. Well, I want to end with this question. What is wrong with Ghana football? Under this administration, I can catalogue a lot of competitions that we've gone to from at a 23 tournament to under 20. Yes, we won at a 20 tournament some time back, but uh, we we seem to have a problem. I mean, what what do you think generally is wrong with Ghana football? Let's wrap it up. There, there's not a plan. I think that's the, the most straightforward way to say it. There is no plan to take well, boys, essentially, into youth national teams, U17, into U20, potentially into U23, have that come through into the Black Stars. There's not that transition. You, you look at that U20 team that you named that, that won the tournament. How are they playing? Was that a way that was going to translate into the Black Stars? Whereas you look at what Senegal are doing and they're able to take U20s straight into the national team and they look good. They're playing exactly the same or very similar system. I think that's part of it. And, and I think the plan extends to more than that. It's talent identification. It's being able to identify specific roles, profiles. It's being able to have plan Bs for guys being like Partey being injured, Kudus being injured. What's the plan B? Apparently, it's Ranford Yuboa Koenigsdorfer, who's literally played one game when he came to AFCON. Mm -hmm. Those types of things where we're talking about planning and having a plan, ultimately, it's all about identity. And obviously, we've heard about the national DNA document. We've not seen it. Mm -hmm. um, those things, it's, it's all a part of the bigger issue that yes. no one's sitting down and going, how do we build a cohesive national program? Mm -hmm. um, and I think until Ghana do that, they will have, they've still got talent. You've got right to dream producing talented players who potentially can take Ghana to, to, to win tournaments if yeah. they're harnessed the right way. Yeah. But it does, it's a, it's a longer term play. And I think that's what Ghana need and they need a plan and they need someone who's going to stick around and see it through uh, as well. And obviously Bern Bernhard Lippert's been let go, so it's not going to be him. Um, Chris Hewton's contract expires after the end of the afternoon. I imagine it's probably not going to be him. Mm -hmm. So it, it's it's probably going to be the next the next guys, whoever mm -hmm. they are, the next appointments. It's, it's going to be so crucial to give Ghana direction, to give Ghana football a direction, to give them a plan, and, and hopefully then to be given time to see that through because it's not going to be a quick fix. Yeah. The national to the Black Stars might be yeah. quicker because there's so much talent, but yeah. the long-term play, it's going to be five to ten years, I would think. Are we on the brink of another exit? You never say never. AFCON's a wild tournament. And also, three teams go through. Right? I mean, Ghana, Ghana, if Ghana draw with Egypt and then beat Mozambique, then they're probably going to go through as one of the best third-place teams. So, yeah. it, they're still in with a shot, but I think they they need to I think they need to perform against Egypt. So I don't I mean they could even lose against Egypt and beat Mozambique. But if they lose in the right way against Egypt in a way that gives them momentum, that gives them players a little bit more confidence. Actually, there were things that were going well in that game. We we can do that. And if we do that against Mozambique, we might be able to score three, four, five goals, put ourselves up to three points with a good goal difference, uh, and potentially get through as the best third place team. We'll see. But yeah, it's not looking ideal at the moment. Thank you very much, Scott. Always great having this conversation with you on the Black Stars and football in general. I mean, that's very insightful. We are grateful for your time and we'll be bringing you back on on the other episodes of Afghan Daily. And thank you so much for watching Afghan Daily. It's been great having you. Thanks to you from wherever you are watching us. Remember to hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell. If this is your first time joining us, remember to like, share our videos with your friends because we are giving you all the great content you have, you would want to have here on United and everything football. We are out of here. We'll see you tomorrow. Have a great time.